Thank you so much. Um, how's everybody doing? Great. Wasn't Laurie's presentation amazing? It was really enlightening, right? It brought, I mean, I, I've, we've all had experiences with people like this, and then we don't realize it, and all of a sudden we step back and realize that we've done this, and like, wow, it's a really eye-opening thing. Um, I'm remind, I was brought up in New York, um, uh, and I moved to the West Coast a long time ago, but I was brought up, I was reminded, as Laurie's talk was going on, I was reminded of what was called the Mid-Manhattan Study, which took place in the, in the mid-60s, and they basically tried to determine what the average level of of behavioral uh, stability was for people who were living in midtown Manhattan. And uh, they did this study over two years, and they basically discovered that something like seven or eight out of 10 people could be proven sociopathic or, nar or narcissistic or psychotic. And they were good scientists. They were really good research scientists. And they realized, well, we can't jerry-rig our, our results. But what we can do is change the standards. So they changed the criteria of what, they, what was determined as normal. And so one day, the people on their study who, were ab, who exhibited aberrant behavior and identified as sociopaths, the next day when they changed the standards, all of a sudden they're normal. So that would sort of give you a little bit of a framework and understanding of what we have going on today. And that follows what, what Laurie was talking about. Um, the issue of, of media and social engineering is something that, that's not new. I mean, we think of it as new because we've been working, we, we have our lives, we're, we, we've been brought up with television and, and radio and telephones and now the internet, of course, and social media. But in fact, um, social engineering by media has been going on since basically thousands of years. It, whether it was by kings and queens, whether it was by religion, and whether it was by um, now corporations, the issues are, are the same, right? And we'll get into this in greater detail. So the, the point that that I'm trying to make here is that we're facing an ever-increasing onslaught of media inputs. We consume media on a daily basis. We get it from multiple sources and with the internet and social media and cell phones and texts and everything else, it's a constant on onslaught. And so the question is, is how do you define and determine what's right for you to believe? How do you determine what's factual? How do you determine what's truthful? And then how do you know that you're actually being accurate with yourself when you're observing that and making those decisions for yourself? So this talk today is basically going to be about that. The question is, can you tell the difference? As Laurie talked about, do you know, are you aware enough, are you educated enough to be aware, to trust your body, and to trust your own responses? Because if you're not, that's the very moment that you're hooked. right? And we'll get into that in a couple of moments also. I have a lot of material that I want to cover today. So if I go really fast, bear with me. Um, next question. I really want to know who you are. So. Who in, in this room, I mean, I, I know Ashland has a pretty specific, interesting cohort of, of people. Who in this room would consider themselves a digital native? By that, I mean someone who was brought up with the internet, sort of brought up with computers, um, brought up with cell phones. OK, this is not, this, some people, are, some of it would be defined by age, but some of it is really defined by attitude and approach. So we don't have very many people who are actual digital natives in the room. And digital natives typically are, are Gen Z, up to 25 years of age, and millennials, up to about 35 years of age, right? So those are people who are brought up with video games, brought up with cell phones, brought up with um, the internet, brought up with computers. It's intrinsic. They understand it. And they basically are running the world right now because they understand technology, and they understand software, and they understand what that means. And their experience of the world is very frictionless. Most of us are baby boomers or Gen X in this room, and we're brought up in a room in a lives that have a lot of friction in our lives because we move through time and space in a certain way. Gen Z and millennials, they don't have that experience, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, second question. I forgot my question, sorry. Um, second question. Um, how do you primarily consume media? Who, how do you consume media? Who reads newspapers anymore? Do you read physical newspapers or do you read it online? Okay, and who, who listens to radio? And who listens to TV? And, and how do you determine what's truthful? How, what are the biases that you know exist in the world and how do you determine what's factual? Who do you trust, right? So those are important questions. And the last question really is, um, um, how many of you do some form of meditation or something that takes you inside? Well, this is Ashland. I would have expected 90, a 90% response, right? right? But it, the truth is, the truth is, I mean, I started meditating when I was 15. 
there was like that many people in the country doing meditation at that point, and there are that many options. Now there are op there are so many options and so many different possibilities, and it's an extraordinary socio-cultural curve to to see how this has happened over the last forty or fifty years. It's really extraordinary, and I think it really goes along with what I would consider at, at the beginning of a really massive hockey stick growth curve in terms of a social renaissance that's happening on the planet. And we're in this major transition period now. So um, I wanna take you on a, on a journey today that is gonna be pretty far reaching. It's gonna to touch on a number of different topics. It's certainly gonna to touch on media and social engineering, but it's also gonna to touch on quantum physics and neurophysiology, and it's also gonna to touch on meditation. So there are three things I want you to keep in mind. Scale, right? Which is basically how do we go from small to large in volume or in territory? Velocity, which is speed, right? And the third is what I call torque. Normally in physics, that's when you have a torque wrench, you turn something and it's, it's, the, it's the resistance that you get. But I'm using that term a little differently. I'm using the word torque to talk about the impact on an individual and on a culture that happened through social means. Right? Or that happens through media. So think, keep these three things in mind as we go through this. There are three key takeaways from this talk, and, the, and they're really the takeaways reflect the three key sections that I want to talk about. And the first is that we're all programmers. And we can, I'll define what programmers is in a couple of moments. The second is that we need to develop the skills to discern between our conscious thoughts and our subconscious thoughts. And obviously there are subconscious thoughts we don't always know about, but they show up in different ways in our lives. And so we have to be very, very attentive to that. And as Laurie said, listen to our bodies and remember what's going on. And the third is when and how to use your reality distortion field. So for those of you who know Steve Jobs, you know he's very well known and famous for what's called his reality distortion field. And I'll talk about that in a couple more minutes. So the first part of the talk is really about um, the, the, the media landscape and social engineering and what it means for you. So the key thing, right, we're, we're, we're bombarded by technology, we're bombarded more and more by artificial intelligence, we're bombarded by lots of things that we have no control over. But the truth is, we do. We actually have a tremendous amount of control. We get to choose what we consume, we get to choose how we consume it, when we consume it, the speed and the scale with which we consume it, and we get to choose whether or not it's real. The question of, of whether or not you choose to believe it as factual or real is not just up to our minds and our brains. It's up to our hearts and it's up to our bodies. So we'll talk about that a little bit more. But it's your responsibility. It's our responsibility to do that. And I myself, I'm in, I do a lot of work in media and I've had to really reduce my media consumption seriously, seriously reduce it, right? The cell phones that we have around us all the time, put them away, right? Really put them away, turn off the texting. It, it, it will change your life. Um, so I, I know we've, we've only been here for about an hour, but I wanna do a little exercise. I want everybody to stand up, please. Great, stretch a little bit to the left or the right. Wonderful. Now turn to the person on your left and Look them in the eye, get, do a little eye gazing for five seconds, three to five seconds. Okay, I know you've done it before, right? Okay. Okay, wait, Ashlyn, 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 calm down. <laughs> okay, now I want you to turn to the person on your right and shake their hand. Great. Now turn to the person behind you and give them a hug. Okay, and now turn to the person in front of you or whatever configuration you have and look, them, look at them and then immediately turn away from them. All right. Now we can sit, thank you. Right, so, so 
all of, all of you have done that, that first exercise in some version or another in some self-improvement or self-help class or group group, right? And you probably expected that I was going to ask you to do the same thing when you turn to the person on your right. And then you were a little perplexed when I didn't, but you were wondering what was going to happen the third time. But by the fourth time, you figured out that I was doing something different, right? What did I do different? Well, what I did different was that I did a pattern interrupt on what was going on in your learned behavior from the past. You've had multiple experiences of this, and you just accepted what was happening that was going to go forward in a certain trajectory that you had experiences from in the past. Well, think about that. That's already hardwired into your brain. So think about how many other things are hardwired into your brain that you just take as normal, and you never interrupt that pattern, right? Now, think of it another way. I just sat in front of an entire room of 100 people and programmed you. I have an implicit point of authority because I'm standing up here in front of a room like a teacher or a politician or a religious leader or anybody of that nature or, or a newscaster on TV. I have a podium. I'm a, on a stage. I'm elevated. I'm in an implicit position of authority. So how many times in our lives do we accept that implicit position of authority when the person up there on the stage or whoever it is on the TV is uttering absolute nonsense, right? And you bypass, you bypass your experience and your feeling, and you go, well, I'm going to trust that person. We've all seen, like, there's a, history is rife with all of this, right? And as Laurie talked about, most of it tends to be sociopathic and narcissistic behavior. That's the kind of personality type that go, that becomes those kinds of leaders. And we witness that today, unfortunately, in, in a grave level of scale and a grave level of velocity. Right? So the, the bottom line is that all of our experiences program us. Right? Every experience we've had from being in utero in our mother's womb to what happened in preschool or nursery school to what happened in elementary school, if we've had any religious training, if we've had anything at all, right? all of that has programmed us in some ways, much of it with good intent, but the fact of the matter is, you're programmed, right? And we're either programmed by something outside of us, or we're programmed by something inside of us, and we have to change. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? All right? And if you look at this, I chose this slide particularly for the trigger, action, reward. Right? Trigger, action, reward. No different than problem, reaction, solution. Exactly the same. So the question is, what do you do about it? Since, we're all, since we've all been emotionally imprinted as kids, how does that affect us throughout the rest of our lives, right? You get, to be about, you get to be about the age of 12 or 14 or 16 or 18, and you go, something's wrong. I'm not like, what the world that I'm experiencing is not jiving with how I really feel. Could be some bad religious thing. It could be some bad dysfunctional thing in your family. It could be school. It could be any number of different things. But the point is, at some point, you made a choice to start thinking for yourselves, typically with your mind, or if you're in a really bad environmental situation with your bodies as well, but typically you made a choice and you, what, you did what I call you disrupted yourself. You did a pattern interrupt, right? And we've spent, you know, most of us in this room are probably in our 40s or 50s or 60s and some older, but we might have recognized that when we were in our teens and we spent the last 40 years trying to get back to what we were as little kids, right? But it's true, right? So as Laurie was saying, fear, no, fear and all these other emotional traumas have all these, these focus points, these locus points on the body. And there are many, many different tools with which you can use. And, and we did a great, a great experience with EFT with Laurie. Um, but there are multiple tools out there. And the good news is that there's, there's a tremendous panoply of, of modalities that you can use that, affect, that, are, that do everything in that whole mind-body spectrum. And just choose whatever you love and do it. So the point is that you have, the, you have the position and the ability to choose and to choose differently and to disrupt yourself. And we'll get into the process of disruption a little bit later. You know, I've spent about 35 years in tech, almost. Sort of <laughs> a little humbling to think that sometimes. Um, and this, the disruption thing is, has been considered both a, a good thing and a bad thing. And I'm going to tell you that I unbelievably, unequivocally think that it is a good thing. A, unequivocally think that, and I'll tell you why. So when I was a kid growing up in, in the East Village in Manhattan, um, it was a very multicultural neighborhood. It was pretty working class, very, very family, 
Um, it was an extraordinary place to grow up, especially in the 60s. It was sort of, if you know about Haight-Ashbury in San Francisco, the East Village was that epicenter in New York. It was an extraordinary place to be. Um, and, and there were three, basically there were three newspapers. There was the New York Times, there was the Daily, the Daily News, and the New York Post. So the Daily News and the New York Post were clearly more, more for the common person, more quote unquote working class. Um, and even though our family was very working class, it was very Jewish intellectual. And so the New York Times was my, my newspaper of default every single day from when I was about six years old onward. Um, and there, at the same time, television was really just beginning to be used in a major form of mass media, right? And there was only three major TV stations, ABC, NBC, and CBS, right? And then there were local affiliates all over the country. And then there was a handful of, of New York City local stations as there were in most major cities. But fundamentally, our lives were mediated by these three men, by, by, da by, by David Brinkley, by Walter Cronkite, and by um, Howard K. Smith. Thank you, Daniel, right? And, they're men, right? And they're basically setting the emotional tone of the nation. And we look to them for everything. And of course, it was really Walter Cronkite, of the three of them, Walter Cronkite is father knows best, right? So just think about what we were brought up with and how that influenced our lives and, and influenced everything else and how we feel today. So I want to talk a little bit about media because it's the most important thing um, that we're here uh, confronted with right now. Um, I tried to get information, I, I tried to go back to 1970 as a reference point um, and get some information about media ownership and, 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 and size, and I couldn't find any research, nothing, zero. The internet did not have anything, there was no aggregation. But starting around 1982, there's a lot of researchers that started doing a lot of, of, of aggregation and compendiums. Pew, Pew Center for, for Media Research has done a great report, PBS did some great reports, um, there's been a lot of local activism in the last um, five years that have done a lot of this. But the basic point is that um, in, in, uh, in 1982, there were something like 1,200 media outlets, and they were basically controlled by 50 independent companies. By the year 2000, that number had dropped to tw about, the, the number of media outlets had increased, and, and the number of companies had dropped to 25. By 2012, that number had dropped to six. They own 90% of the media in the country, right? And you can see who they are. Um, Comcast, Disney, Time Warner, Fox, CBS, and Viacom. Guess what it is now? Five companies. In 2019, there are five companies that control 90% of the media outlets in the US. Um, and most of that is because Viacom and CBS are now basically owned and controlled by the same company, by amusement, uh, amusement conglomerate, I forgot the exact name. Um, it's really scary, but what's more scary is the power of lobbying that all of these companies have exerted on Congress. And we see this not just in media, we certainly see this in, in, in medicine, as, as Jennifer's gonna talk about. We, we see this in, in, um, in, in pretty much every field that, that affects us as humans on, in this country. But we see the level of influence of, corporate, of corporations at every, every level. And they write most of the legislation, as Laurie said. That 1,000-page 9-11 Patriot Act report did not just appear. It was written. Somebody wrote it. And most of the time, it was not congressional aides, right? So just to give you another sense of media, um, just look at this and look at where you consume your media and look at who owns it. And if they own it, they control editorial content. And if they control editorial content, it's very, very subtle how they do it. Fox is very overt, right? But if you look at Fox, if you, like one night, if you just look at Fox News and you look at MSNBC, it's the same. It is the same. And when I say it's the same, what I mean is the level of editorial slant and editorial bias is the same. They've, one takes one side, one takes the other side. Now, has there been any other time in your life or in, in any other time in history when you have two different sides where we're, you're forced to take one side or the other because everything in the middle is, is never really talked about and you present it with oppositional forces and you have to make a choice and a decision? Try a two-party election as an example, right? So this is really scary when you get into it, and we haven't even talked about what's happening on the internet. 
We haven't even talked about the fact that YouTube is the second biggest search engine on the planet and they control media. We haven't talked about Twitter. We haven't talked about Facebook, right? But we, we all know over the last couple of years, oh, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm, let me get to one other point. Um, the good news is about media is that because we're in a digital world, the tools for filmmaking, the tools for storytelling and the distribution channels have dropped in price. So you can buy a $2,000 or a $1,000 camera right now, video camera, and you can go out and make a film and you can post it on YouTube and you can reach millions of people. That's extraordinary. That level of power has never ever been, been available to any individual before. If you wanted to do a documentary, half a million to a million bucks, minimum. Where are you gonna get the funding? Then, where are you gonna distribute it? PBS, very narrow rules. ABC, CBS, NBC, not gonna happen. Fox, not gonna happen. Now you at least have opportunities to distribute it publicly and, and on your own website or on YouTube, which is an extraordinary opportunity. At the same time, you have to look out for the, the, the very natural biases that are happening in every single piece of media that you watch, because no one is unbiased. There is no such, no such thing as an objective documentary. It's do, it does not exist. Um, this is a really interesting talk, uh, in slide rather. Um, um, when I was a kid growing up, I had heard that there were, um, that there were patents that were issued in the 1950s um, dealing with the scan rate of television. And I, I did a lot of, re I've done a lot of work with patents in USPTO, US Patent and Trademark Office. And I actually um, have tried for a couple of years, uh, every now and then to, to research where those patents were, and I've not found them. So it might be an urban myth or it might be true. Could be that the patents got scrubbed, which is certainly a possibility or hidden from view. But the point is, is that um, in 2003, USPTO did grant a patent that was about identifying the scan rate, not just of television, but of computer monitors, which includes um, iPads and, and um, laptops and um, uh, tablet computing, and probably now even watches, right? That basically say the scan rate can manipulate through its electromagnetic field, can manipulate the nervous system of the people who are watching it, right? So this is a really important point, right? Because if, if that patent that was taught, supposedly granted in the early 50s is accurate, then you think about the level of hypnosis that exists because of the frequency and the scan rate that comes out on television, and you realize that there is a reason why they call it programming. We're all being programmed, right? And now here's the really interesting thing. The frequency that they're doing this at, the scan rate that they're doing this at, is actually like a scalar wave. And if you understand a scalar wave, a scalar wave is really a carrier wave. It just carries whatever is along with it. So when you look at the content that goes along that's put on top of this, right? The audio signal, what we're hearing, the music, the, the visual signal, right? 80% of our sensory input in, in our bodies is visual. Unless we're, unless we're blind, of course, right? But 80% 80, 80 of what we take in, and we'll talk about that in a little bit later in terms of the amount of information that we consume. But the, the point is, is you get a double whammy. You get the hypnosis from what's happening because of the frequency, and you get the repetition of audio and video that's coming at you, and we all know, understand this, that this happens in commercials. So, um, if, in the last few years, last three years or so, it's become pretty widely well known uh, with the debacle at Facebook because of, of um, Cambridge Analytica that they were harvesting your data. Well, anybody who's in the tech world understands this. We've known this for years. If you're not paying for something, you're the product. You're not paying for free television. Well, you are. You're paying with your attention on commercials, right? And we all know, we understand four times to see something, you sort of begin to have some recall, seven times better recall. By 21 times that you've seen a commercial, you're kind of locked in. But at the subconscious level, when you go to the store, you're gonna buy Procter & Gamble or whatever the, the advertisement is. But the point is, is, is that we're all, we, we are the product if we think we're getting it for free. But the problem is, is that how often do you change? Do you really change your behavior? Or are we so, so addicted to convenience that we're willing to go to Google every time we want to do a search, or we're willing to go to Facebook because we want to connect with people when there are many really good alternatives. And as an example, DuckDuckGo and both Startpage.com are both really great search engines. 
they don't track your IP address, right? If you really want to get super sophisticated, get a VPN, a virtual private network, which basically routes your IP signal through about six or seven different, different servers in different places in the world, and your IP address is masked. They can't track you, right? Well, I would urge you, if you have the capacity and the interest and your privacy is really important, get a VPN. They're not that expensive. They're easy to set up. And right now, you can get them on your phones, right? But the point is, is there are alternatives. But the reason we don't do that is because humans have a herd instinct. We're pack animals. We want to belong. So the question I will ask you is, how much of yourself are you giving up because of that feeling of wanting to belong, to be part of something, to be part of a tribe? Right? The moment you step outside of that tribe, you're ostracized. Right? It takes a lot to do that. You got to have a pretty strong sense of self. So where does that sense of self come from? So um, depending upon who you talk to, and the research will show that people think that there's any neuroscientists and psychologists, social psychologists suggest that there's any that the average human has between 10,000 and 80,000 thoughts a day. Most of it's subliminal. Most of it's just coming. It's not. It's only five percent of your conscious mind, right? So, what are the thoughts? Are you are you a victim? Is it love or fear, abundance or scarcity? Here or a victim? I can do this. I can't do this. What are you feeling, right? Now, think about this for a moment. There's a hundred people in the room. There's seven point eight billion people on the planet. They're all thinking one version or another of those thoughts. Right? Now imagine the planet. Thoughts are things, right? Emotions are thoughts, thoughts are things. They all carry a frequency, right? The, the, the difference in frequency between hate and love is tremendous. There's a lot of work that, that has demonstrated all this, but it's all vibration, it's all physics. So think about almost 8 billion people on the planet being in fear. Look at what we're experiencing now. Imagine if 8 billion people were in love. Now there's a lot of there's a lot of research to suggest that if you that there's a there's the hundredth monkey effect, right? And that a very small percentage of the population can impact people at a different level, not at the conscious level, but at the subconscious level through a magnetic field effect in physics. We can talk about that later. But the point is, is what thoughts are you buying into <coughs> individually? Because the individual, every thought that we have in this room is impacting this room. And every thought that we have is impacting the collective at scale. And now at greater velocity, because it's happening much, much faster. We've all experienced that our lives are accelerating and speeding up. So horrible to think about, right? But too, too, I mean, he demonstrated too much of a bad thing will kill you, literally. He, he, if anybody's not familiar with this movie, watch the movie. He did a month of only eating McDonald's. By the end of that month, his body was shutting down. He was having liver failure. He was having kidney failure. He was, I mean, the, 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 me, the medical and health metrics were off the charts, right? But the point is, is that all of this is happening, as, as Lori pointed out, from the reptilian brain, right? All of it, right? And they know they, there's a lot of food science that basically says, what do people respond to? How much salt should we have to get people addicted? And that, the, 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 um, the tobacco industry has known that for years, right? Juul was trying to say something different, the e-cigarettes by vaping. They, they were like more evil than the cigarette guy. OK, so let's talk about emotional triggers for a moment, because emotional triggers have been around for thousands of years. And they've been used very, very, very effectively. Um, they didn't have the scale, and they didn't have the velocity in their late. Oh my God, we're not even ten minutes. Whoa. Um, okay, you understand emotion. You understand this. I'm not going to go into it. Um, neuromarketing, latest, the latest stuff that's happening. Ten years old. Um, it's basically using an, an, um, new tools to understand how human beings um, can can be manipulated. I'm going to go on. You can, see, you can see all this. I'll share the slide deck. Um, color, same thing, right? Color influences us dramatically. May, there may be some relationship with, with the chakra system. I haven't done enough research to make direct correlation, but it's an interesting area of research. Um, color, Panatone Color Institute just came out 
um, or last month, earlier this month, with the color blue for the for for the twenty for, for twenty twenty. Why? We need. We're in a time that requires trust and faith. We need constancy and confidence. Did Panatone come out with that because they did market research and they understood what people wanted, or did they say, "Oh no, this is what we want to program people with"? Right? Could be a little bit of both. Right? So Pavlov. Pavlov is right. We either pro get programmed by others or we're programmed or we program ourselves. Who's programming who? <laughs> right? Think and I'll just make this real. Think of any relationship you're in. If you're in a long-term relationship with a partner, you've trained each other. Right? It's obvious. We know this. We understand this. Okay, next stage. Subject object. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna try and go through this quick. But um, basically we live in a subject object world. Right? The subject needs the object, the object needs the subject, and um, the way we experience reality here, woman perceives the cat, brings in light rays, causes a, there's some, some neural representation of the cat, and there's a nanosecond delay, a nanosecond delay between what you perceive and your cognitive capability to recognize what that is. Now, most of the time, that experience comes from memory. But even if it doesn't, even if it's something new, Right? You're in a situation where you're not actually perceiving reality. You're perceiving a holographic image of reality. Right? So when, in, in many of the great scriptures, when they talk about maya or illusion, and they're talking about this, they're talking about the perceptual capability of what you actually see. They're not saying that this podium isn't real. It's real. But what do you perceive? What are you seeing? OK. So um, if you look at, just let's go briefly into Newton and Heisenberg and, and quantum physics. So in, 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 in Newtonian physics, they basically say the object is static, right? There is no change in the object, right? And, Newtonian, and, and, and we've lived our lives like that for th hundreds of years, right? Along comes Heisenberg and Max Planck and Einstein and Bohr in the early 1900s, and they're saying, no, it's all wrong. And Heisenberg basically says, apart from the uncertainty principle, he says, no, you, the mere fact that you as an observer are observing something, you're influencing the outcome. Of, that, of, of what you observe. So therefore, there's a difference between living your life from a Newtonian point of view and living your life from a quantum point of view. So what does that mean? There's an in, it's a difference between an inner reality and an outer reality. Again, are we consuming media? And what are we choosing to believe? Or, or are we creating our own internal world? So the electromagnetic, so HeartMath has done some really great research over the last um, 30 years. And you know, since Descartes and the mind-body split three or four hundred years ago, we all think that you know this is the only part of our bodies from our head, from our neck up, right? It's the furthest thing from the truth, as Laurie talked about, right? Heart Math Institute, um, thirty years, has been doing this great research for thirty years, and they basically said no, the heart literally puts out uh, an electromagnetic field that is sixty times the amplitude of the brain at the electromagnetic level. So the old saying of in the sixties, you know, you have good vibes, is really true. And thank goodness that there's a lot of really great neuroscience and, and quantum physics work that's coming out right now that's demonstrating that. Part three, what's reality? This is where it gets really interesting, right? Um, in my mind, whatever's up there, <laughs> whatever's connected. Um, this guy, uh, Anil Seth, did a talk at, at TED Talk um, a couple of years ago. And he's a researcher in the UK, a uh, neuroscientist. And basically what he says, your brain hallucinates your reality. So what does he mean by that? He means that the sensory input that's coming into our minds is so great, right, at any given time, that the brain can't process it. Even, even people at the highest level of intellect, it's not about the intellect, it's about the neural apparatus and how connected your synaptic connections are, right? So you take in so much, but the brain can't handle it. So it selects certain things. And then it fills in the gaps from memory. So again, you're not really perceiving reality. You're perceiving the holographic image that your brain has created for you. It's a, it's a neurochemical process, right? So think about that for a moment. I'm just gonna say one thing before I get to Steve Jobs. Um, the brain processes a billion, billion calculations per second. A billion, billion. Even the greatest supercomputers now don't come close to that maybe 1% of that. So we're not gonna get into artificial intelligence and artificial emotional intelligence and the next stage because that's not part of the talk. But the point is, is that the brain 
and everything that we have, the neural apparatus that we have, is a cosmic computer. It's extraordinary. And that's why we need to use it in a way that's discerning so that we can actually choose our lives. So we all understand Steve. We, we all use his products in one form or another. He's changed six industries. Personal computing, music, animated movies, mobile phones, tablet computing, and digital publishing. Not bad for a guy who dropped out of college, right? He's a brilliant guy, but he, he, asked, he had people do what no one ever could do, and that's called Steve could distort, Andy Herzberg, who was on the original Macintosh team, said, Steve could distort an audience's sense of proportion and scales of difficulties and make them believe that the task at hand was possible. And that was very, very, both favorably and unfavorably called Steve's reality distortion field. Right? So, and normally, most people would say that's a negative. And I'm here to tell you, from my point of view, and I think the reality distortion field is the single most important thing that we all have, right? Because the people who believe, the people who believe that, that in Steve and the people who believe what he believed and who believe that it could be done, their, their reality wasn't distorted at all. Their reality was it could be done, right? So just because you didn't believe that in Steve, that meant that you were, you were the outlier in his, in his cohort, right? So I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to suggest that, sorry, so the key learning there is that reality is in the eye of the beholder, right, just like beauty, that reality is clearly mutable, and that different perceptions can create positive or negative influences for the individual and the collective, right? You can see it very easily. Look at the perception of reality that Hitler had. Look at the perception of reality that Einstein had. Look at the perception of reality that John F. Kennedy had of putting a man on the moon. Three very different people, very different perceptions, and look at what they look at what they created in the collective because of their own ideas. And I would suggest that the reality distortion field is the single most important thing for humanity, because it what's, it's what separates us and moves humanity forward. It's the people who believe that that we are in, that we can innovate, that we can change the world, that we can do things, and we create a field effect around us. Everybody in this room, who is an architect of the new paradigm has a particular reality distortion field that's different than everybody else. Doesn't mean that they're wrong, right? Doesn't mean that we're right. But it tends that we're going in a certain direction that makes it really, really helpful for all of us. Um, imagine this at the global level. I said earlier uh, about the, we're at the beginning of a hockey stick growth curve. I really believe that we're in the, so in, in technology, there's a hockey stick growth curve as opposed to a normal growth curve of business. And you have to hit a certain inflection point and, the, and your, your, your market growth goes up like that, right? And we're like right at that beginning curve of the hockey stick, right? Where the base of the hockey stick meets the angle going up. I really believe that, not just because of the digital technology, but for a lot of other reasons, the transformation, the, the transformative period that we're in right now is literally the beginning of the greatest human renaissance we've ever seen. And at the same time, we're also seeing a tremendous oppositional force. And think of nature. Nature operates in that same way. And I'll tell you right now, I believe that we're going we're gonna to prevail. This, this level of consciousness will prevail. It might take a while. But it might take a while. It might not be in our lifetime, truly. It, it might take 50 or 100 years for that to start to reach a more, a more mass. I actually don't think that it will. I think it's going to happen in the next 20 years. But, but who knows? We're, the, more, the more we do things together, the better it will be. Um, again, it's all up to you. And I'm going to come back to the same things that I talked about earlier, which is it's all about strength and scale and speed and velocity and the human mind and how we use our resources and we use the tools that we have in front of us. Um, perception is reality. What do I have? Is the glass full, right? OK. What is it now? Ah, kind of divided, half full, half empty. OK, don't judge yourself. You're not pessimist, you're not optimist, right? Right? If, if in the Newtonian world, you could say it's half empty. You could also say it's half full. Some people in the Newtonian world would look at this and go, no, it's actually always full, because it's always has oxygen in it, right? I'm going to suggest to you that the glass is always full. Because 
it's, if you look at the world from an Antonian point of view, what you're saying is accurate. But if you look at it from a physics point of view, from a, from a quantum physics point of view, it's always full. Right? What's in there? What's the vacuum of space? It's not air. It's energy. It's the greatest potential of the universe. It's what connects us to the cosmos. We all have this experience. We all have this possibility. So the f fact of the matter is, I assume I've drunk the whole glass, please. <laughs> now the whole glass is full, right? The whole room is full. Do I need the glass? No, I don't need the glass. And the point of that little, little exercise is basically to say, we have the capacity, all of us, to look at the world and experience it from that point of view. Oh, Jordan, can you give me 30 seconds? 30 seconds. Okay, so the way, the way media gets in is through core wounds that we all have, right? We all understand this. I'm not good enough, I'm not worthy, I, I'm, I'm not lovable, I don't belong. That's how it gets in, right? And if it gets in at the individual level, it gets in at the collective level. So, but it's an inside game. And just like the quantum physics thing is, is connects you, you have to go inside and do that in whatever way you do that. You all, you live in Ashland. I'm gonna make a, a, an assumption that probably you've all done something like that as I asked in my, first, my fourth question earlier on. So use whatever tools you have and do it. This was a, this was a meditation, I'm not gonna do it. So um, I was gonna do a guided meditation just so everybody could have that experience, but you all know what that's like. So um, there's an old Henry Ford quote that goes, whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. We've all heard that in some form or another. So I'm going to reposition that. Whether you think you live in a Newtonian world or you think you live in a quantum world, you're right. But by virtue of believing that you live in a Newtonian world, you've proven that you live in a quantum world. Right? Let that sink in. And when you, when, when you realize that we've had 100 years of quantum physics, of knowing about quantum physics, and we live our lives trudging through time and space in a Newtonian way. Right? The moment you shift that experience of reality gives you the moment of ultimate freedom. And then anything that happens around you is completely immaterial. Right? Because yourself, that inner being, is what, is what counts. So I'm going to leave you with only three things. Disrupt yourself. At any opportunity, disrupt yourself. Change your internal state of being. Change yourself. Forget about changing the world. Change your world. The world is as you are. The more you change yourself, the brighter your light will be, and the more the world will be happy. Thanks.